Welcome back to the Createx stage at Virtual COGEX. A special welcome to those of you who are new to the stage. The Createx stage is hosted by the Creative Industries Council and supported by Facebook, UKRI, Moore Kingston Smith, and Digital Catapult. I'm Janet Hull, and I'm your MC for today. COGEX is all about community. And if the Creative Industries is the community you want to belong to, just email us at createch at thecreativeindustries.co.uk and we'll make sure to keep you involved. The overall theme of COGEX this year is how do we get the next 10 years right? And for us in the Creative Industries for this next session, this means how do we expand our understanding of the event opportunities provided by this new world where creativity meets technology? Called Live to Virtual, it focuses on how the creative industries are pivoting big ticket events and projects to digital platforms. You might say it's a bit of a reflection on what we are all experiencing at Virtual COGEX this year and key lessons to be learned. But it also looks forward and has some surprises in store. A big thanks to Jane Lee, brand and communications consultant, for pulling together this important session. And a big welcome to Caroline Norbury, CEO, Creative Industries Federation, who will be moderating for us today. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much, Janet. Thank you. And hello and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Um, I'm delighted to be here on this virtual stage with three incredibly talented people from our industry. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce them some introduce themselves to you very shortly um, and then we're going to kick off with um, with a bit of with some questions so I think we're going to start by saying uh, a quick hello from from Lynn hello Lynn hey hello how are you doing thank you for having me hi do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself Lynn yeah of course of course I'm, I'm figuring out where to start but I'll start from the beginning so, so my, my name is Lynn Lester I'm the managing director of events at the drum I've worked there for quite a lot of years, an undisclosed number of years, I have to say. Um, so a very long time. And I also sit on the leadership team. So I have strategic direction into what we do in terms of our global footprint for the company across everything from publishing to events to membership products. Um, I also work with a lot of the sort of tech giants and partners, agencies, brands. So yeah, so quite, quite a wide remit. Right. Thank you very much. And we've also got, um, we have Neil joining us. Hello, Neil. Um, Hello, everyone. Hi, Neil. Hi. Can you give us a quick minute about yourself? Maybe sure. a, a secret uh, that you might Neil be able to share with so many people. Uh, my name is Neil Crombie. I'm the creative director of Swan Films. Uh, we make factual television for a range of broadcasters, mostly BBC Channel 4. Um, uh, I guess I'm here, really, because uh, for the last few weeks, I've been uh, making a show called Grayson's Art Club, which, if anyone of you haven't seen it, has been a an attempt to sort of bring the nation together through creativity and through expressing themselves through art. Um, it has been a huge success and uh, very happy to talk about the lessons learned from it because it's taught me a thing or two about uh, how we make the arts feel relevant to this new landscape that we're all in. So um, I'm imagining that's probably what we'll talk about. But we've been doing some other projects uh, during lockdown as well, in particular a series called Museums in Quarantine. Uh, which was the BBC's attempt to sort of open up shuttered uh, institutions so that the public could see them and see some of the great treasures that are held in our British collections. But I'm imagining that Grayson's Art Club is probably the thing that we'll talk about most. Cool. Great. We'll look forward to finding out a bit more later. And then, um, and then last, but by no means least, we have Kay from Lost Festival. Oh, sorry, Lost Horizon Festival. Hi, Kay. Hi. Hi. I'm Kay Nunes. I'm the creative director at the Shangri-La area of Glastonbury Festival, but now also the creative director of Lost Horizon Festival, which is which will be recreating areas, at, well, spaces within Shangri-La in the virtual world, um, which we just launched yesterday, and the festival will be on the 3rd and 4th of July. Fabulous. So looking forward to finding out a lot more about that in a minute. So with this session, everybody, we wanted to really mark the important role that creativity has played in keeping us together to keeping us together and keeping us going through through lockdown, you know, bringing us together, showing solidarity, um, 
working together more closely as communities through our creativity. And they say that necessity is the mother of invention, and we've certainly seen some truly unique and special experiences from creative practitioners and businesses over the last three months. So we've had everything from, I don't know, Secret Cinema becoming Secret Sofa. In Manchester, we saw the launch of United We Stream and then Hacienda Weekend. We've seen the Museum of Rural Life in Reading team up with Nintendo game Animal Crossing. And we've watched as musicians have moved their performances from venues to Twitch. Uh, We've listened to classic albums with Tim Burgess's Twitter listening parties. That's been fabulous fun. And we've sung along with Gareth Malone's Great British Home Chorus. Uh, we've seen performances from the National Theatre at home and we've danced to live DJ sets from Jarvis and Sophie in our kitchens. And as we're experiencing right now, we've seen conferences and festivals pivot to an online offer. So today what we're going to do is to talk about some of the work that has happened during lockdown and consider what lasting change they will, they will make in our recovery and whether this is a one-off or whether this is definitely um, the sign of things to come. So we're gonna start with, um, with you, Lynn, uh, and, and a, a question to you. So um, a week before lockdown, the Drum launched your Digital Transformational Festival that you positioned as a new kind of festival for a rapidly changing world. Um, I know that you'd always planned for this festival to be online, but I'm interested to know how it evolved over the six weeks that it was live. Um, I imagine your original agenda had to move at quite a pace um, as the world sort of shifted around you. Uh, so it'd be really interesting if you could share with us how you adapted the festival during this period. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, to, to give you a bit of background, so contrary to belief and I think most of the market think we had this planned we, we didn't have it planned we we had no idea we were going to do anything virtual we had a live events business plan and this all kind of came about I was in Singapore mid-February on business and it was when all the lockdown was going on companies were you know the banks were clearing out everybody was quarantined so we kind of knew that obviously rightly so everyone in the world knew that something was going on and then when I got back to the UK, I, I didn't think for a minute it was going to come here. I was just so naive, just thinking we would just sort of plod along, do our own thing. And literally, as it was getting really, really serious, we thought, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Like we, our business plan is based on live events. So we, within a week and a half of deciding, we came up with a virtual conference idea. So we had one and a half weeks to pull off a six-week conference. So we had never done it before. We didn't really know where to start. So this is where the kind of like solidarity of our team came together because everybody, you know, suddenly you don't have an events team anymore. Everyone is a team in the business. Everybody pulls together. So we basically came up with the theme of digital transformation because in real time, the drum was digitally transforming its business. And we were doing what everybody else was doing. So it felt like a really fitting topic because our belief and, and really our raison d'etre is to help our readers make better decisions. And everybody's trying to make these decisions at once and nobody really knows if they're doing it right or what should they do or what shouldn't they. So we created a program of content over six weeks where you know, we were learning from brands, we were learning from major agency heads, we were learning from just, we were all hustling it together. And it just, it almost felt like the most surreal, I think six weeks of my life. Um, so the way we kind of worked it was, when we decided to do this, we thought, okay, we'll have a bit of a content plan. We've got a rough idea of who we want. Remember, we've got to program six weeks. So we, we programmed the first week. <laughs> we managed to get out a studio in London, um, which was um, in Curtin Road in, in Shoreditch. And we kitted out this studio, which we had from the Monday to the Thursday. And we got as much content produced as we could. Now, you can tell from my accent, I'm not from London. So come the Thursday, we knew the announcement was coming on the Friday. I had to get myself home to Scotland in case I was locked down in London. And I have to say, London was the most scariest place because there was no one there. So it felt the most eerie it's, it's ever felt in all the times I've went. So we basically put just as much content as we could in that one week. And that allowed us to, to get by into maybe week two. And literally, it was a case of, programming every single week checking in with the content team we were building agendas we were we were learning as we were going to be honest so I was doing a lot of the, the daily recaps so we would get all the talks during the day because it was all pre-recorded it wasn't kind of like a continuation sort of live program and yeah I had to basically do the recaps every day I had my crunchy nut cornflakes box my Amazon box put together created a little tripod I mean it was like the glamour and from that and using the statistics we could then understand what people were watching when they were watching so we were testing learning failing adapting moving as we went and you know I'm, I'm delighted to say that 
you know, it turned out to be probably one of the most successful things we've ever done because all focus of the whole business was on it. So, you know, we engaged over 100 countries and we had about over 140 pieces of content. So, you know, bravo to the drum team. It was um, a lot of hard work. And I think we lost a few years of our life during that period. Um, <laughs> How but it was did you manage to sustain? I mean, six weeks, a festival of six weeks. That's an amazing feat. You know, what do you think was the key to your success in sustaining that? I think it was a passion and the entrepreneurship of the drum. So, you know, we're, we're quite a humble organisation. So, you know, I've been with the drum for a long time, you know, from Scotland, we transcended globally. So for us, we're still quite, you know, we're quite modest and quite humble. And I think because we don't take anything for granted. So it was a passion of the team. Everybody really wants it to work Every, and it's a new challenge. So I think if we couldn't have done it without our team. I mean, our team were, you know, they were basically the, the pot of gold that we needed. And I think also because a lot of people are very supportive of the drum. So in terms of the brands that engage and the agencies, everybody wanted to be part of this and it was new and it was different. And so, yeah, there was a lot of factors involved, but, you know, I'm really grateful to everyone that, that helped. Um, Neil, you've um, produced to and aired the brilliant Grayson's Art Club on Channel 4 over the last two months. And um, I mean, that's been really interesting as well, isn't it, in terms of a format that has evolved and... Um, so I'm quite interested in, in, in talking to you a bit about, about that. But uh, I think w one of the things just to start kick off with is that uh, I think you've had something like a million viewers each week. Um, so I'm really interested to know how the show came about, um, how you at Swan Films brought it together. What have you learned? Have you, I mean, in, in the way that um, Liz has just been talking about sort of testing things out and learning iteratively. I mean, she had, she had six weeks um, I mean, yours is pretty intensive. I think, obviously, Neil, you, your production schedule is quite intensive as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> um, uh, and you've got, you know, and you've got that sort of the added firework, I suppose, of Grace and, it, it, and Philippa it, 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 in the mix as well. But interesting to just hear a bit about your experiences um, and how you managed to, to pull it all together. So it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been literally the most successful collaboration that Grayson and I have ever had together where we we at Swan Films have made all these previous documentary series and they've obviously been very prestigious and very been very big but none of them has been remotely as well received as this and none of them has really punched through in the way we'd hoped they all would than this and that is all because of the circumstances that we made them in so what you were saying earlier I mean it's sort of the most dreadful cliche about necessity being the mother of invention it is true I have discovered it and I can speak for us about the incredible way in which if you don't think the normal way that you have to think about something, you rethink everything about what you're doing. And um, so just to cycle back and sort of tell you a little bit of the thing, it was about very similar experience to Lynn about three weeks before it was clear. I mean, it was all clear to us, wasn't it? That lockdown was going to happen before the government did it. <laughs> uh, about three weeks before, two weeks before, maybe it was clear that lockdown was going to happen and that everyone was just going to be at home um and who knows what else is going to happen i pitched the idea to shaminda Sh nahal who's the commissioning editor of arts at channel four that we do an art club and th the purpose of it being to encourage the british public to use the time that they were stuck at home productively creatively in making art themselves um that was basically the idea um it was clear that we obviously if we were going to do that there had to be a sort of participatory element in that you'd want people at home to be making art and then we had to work out how that would happen so that was that was essentially the idea from that everything else flowed and they it flowed in a sort of day by day very much similar to lynn's experience about how we we're going to do this so for a start it was very clear that we wouldn't be able to film grayson in his studio without a fixed rig now if i pitched to channel four that we were going to fix rig an artist studio the week before they'd have laughed me out of court because obviously fixed rigs are for um a and e departments and um you know police custody cells and things where there's masses of action and actuality the idea of, be of being in a rather placid calm potter studio fixed rig would not have been a flyer that's the first thing that we had to do we realized we need to get a rig in before any, you know before sterilize the rig and blah 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 so that no interaction between myself and the other members of the production team and Grayson and Philippa inside their little studio. So that was the first thing. And it was completely born of the necessity of we wouldn't have been able to point cameras at him in any other way. But of course, 
inadvertently, the result of that was you get an intimacy and a sense that you're in that space with Grayson and Philippa that I've, in all the times that I've filmed Grace in the past, we've never accomplished because there's nobody, they are genuinely on their own there with these tiny little whizzing cameras that they, you know, more or less forget about. So that was the first way in which uh, a, 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 an accidental necessity that, that had to be done, that was the only way it could be done in these lockdown circumstances, produced something really different. Then the next stage of that was, well, how, um, how are we going to get the public to um, to join in? Uh, and um, uh, so obviously we thought right from the beginning that um, we would encourage people to submit art on a theme uh, and then we would somehow select art that seemed to sort of speak to us real, tell us a story about now and the experiences people were going through. That was the sort of the only way we could do it. So there was a deadline, people sent in art, but well, we got apps and suddenly it got, we got overwhelmed. Thousands and thousands and thousands of submissions. And it was at that point, it starts, I suddenly realized we, we're on, to, we've done something much more radical than we thought we had. Um, and um, I think that's, the, you know, we'll come no, back, back to that maybe, but the sort of lesson for me is it really is, it encouraged us to completely reframe what it was we were doing, what, what an arts program is actually for. I now look back on it and I realize that they're all basically framed in a particular way, which is um, they're basically an ex, most arts programs are an exercise in some form of like critical evaluation by someone who knows more than you. Um, you think about it, it's like, this is the best Picasso. Picasso is better than Warhol. Early Warhol is better than late Warhol. The 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 basic exercise of um, uh, not knocking this. It's a valuable thing to do. It's important that people do it. But the basic premise and way that they're framed, arts programs, is somebody who knows more than you is going to tell you what to think. Essentially, suddenly when we open the floodgates and actually you send us your art and you tell the story of how, what your experiences are and how you are feeling this moment, just became the most radically empowering thing for the audience. So we've never had audience engagement like that before. Thousands of people talking about the show on Twitter. People right now are still sort of, well, please bring it back. Blah, blah. And somehow we've impacted, just by changing, more by accident than design, but just by changing the way the thing is framed into being an, an essentially participatory exercise, where we all, audience, Grace and everyone involved, come together to create art that expresses how we're feeling right now in this moment, has energized and sort of revitalized what the whole proposition of an arts program is and what it's for. And we were just, I, I, I cannot tell you how surprised I was by how, uh, how people latched on to that idea and joined in the idea of Art Club. And now we've got all these thousands of pieces of art that people have sent in. There's going to be an exhibition, who knows when, it'll have to be, wait till, you know, we can do that sort of thing in the real world. But the exhibition is like, we've got music, leading museums and galleries all over the country, literally falling over themselves to host the <laughs> exhibition. What a lovely problem to have. It's great. <laughs> It all goes to show, doesn't it, that actually if you are, if the proposition is, the, the, the invitation to the audience is genuinely collaborative, participatory and uh, inclusive, you get a completely different response. Yeah. And you can't fake the authenticity of the offer. Yeah. I think that's really what I've learned. And as, as I stress more by muddling through on a day-to-day -day basis, just like Lynn was saying, than by having a clear agenda that that's where we were going to end up, but that is where we've ended up. Well, that's that's it. That's interesting thing to pick up. So, Kay, um, uh, yesterday you announced your virtual uh, Lost Festival, Lost Horizon Festival. Um, yeah. I, I think you should probably call it Lost Festival because that's what I keep calling it. Because <laughs> anyway, they've all been lost. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here today. So I'm sure you haven't had much sleep over the last week or two. And uh, and I'm wondering, like, it'd be interesting to hear your take on muddling through. But perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the festival, about how the idea came about and what we what we can expect from this fabulous thing. Well, yeah, we so it's very new. We only found out in I think it was the 18th of March that the festival was cancelled and we'd been previously working on it for 
since October. So we'd had everything lined up. Um, we'd engaged with loads of artists. We'd programmed music. We'd um, started buying materials. We, you know, we'd literally were ready to. Um, I think we were about six weeks away from building on on site in the field itself. So, you know, it came as quite a shock to us because we'd invested so much time into it. But then, um, you know, a couple of weeks went by. We all got growing vegetables and sort of, you know, doing things that we never get time to do because this time of year is completely consumed by Glastonbury. And a contact of Chris Kotofu, who's another director of Shangri-La, um, just proposed this idea that he'd been working with Sansa and, and Wookiee Technologies in America about uh, creating um, virtual worlds and conferences and things like that. And they just said, well, what about making Shangri-La in the, in the virtual world? And we were kind of, you know, a lot of the terminology we didn't even understand. Like we're not that techy as, as a company, as, as the three directors anyway. Um, we build things out of wood and recycled materials and, you know, so it's all a new world, but we were like, okay, well, we've got to try. Um, so the way that we design Shangri-La is, is using SketchUp so that we can see how much timber to order and, you know, how I sort of spend loads of time inside a kind of virtual version of, of Shangri-La anyway, just through this um, program. Really basic software, I don't know if you know it, but it's a 3D modeling software. So I kind of, the way that I curate all the art pieces that go into Shangri-La is through spending hours kind of wandering around SketchUp and kind of sort of, you know, putting the pieces into position that way. So, so we were like, well, okay, we could do this, surely. Let's give it a go. And so we've had a team working in America, Wookie, building, we're recreating Shangri-La for us in this way. I'm trying to curate the artwork inside the space without having access to the technology yet. I'm getting a VR headset in a couple of days, so that's going to help. Um, but yeah, we just thought, let's let's try and do something because the, the main thing of, um, you know, one of the main reasons that we organize, or that we've been doing Shangri-La for so long is the community around it and the creativity that people put into it. We have 1,500 people that we work with just in our area. And they, for, from a wide range of practices, from, you know, building to lighting to um, visual art, you know, whatever. So that's the thing that we're really going to miss so much is that community. And so we were thinking, well, what, how can we, how can we kind of keep everyone together? How can we also defy the rules of lockdown and, and still be able to meet in a place on that weekend or, you know, around that weekend? Um, so yeah, this, that's how it's all sort of come about. And we're still in the middle of developing it and building it right now. Um, I'm, I've been working on American time as well. So I've sort of got to start my day again in a minute and <laughs> get a load of assets over to the team there. Because we've got we've had such a huge response from artists, um, not just the, the programming side of things, but visual artists. We're also doing a project with Malcolm Garrett, um, which is we, we, are, we kind of use billboard art in a lot of our work. So we kind of take the mainstream media sort of tactic and and can subvert that. So we we um, invite artists to kind of create a piece of work around a specific theme. This this year's theme for Shangri-La was human connection. So we're keeping that theme going throughout this event as well. Um, and then the plan is to to make prints of that artwork and then donate them all to charity. Because we like you know there, there was no there's no money to make this project either. We're all working on a voluntary basis. Um, we didn't want to take any any funding. There wasn't any time. We we've only just been running it for a few weeks, really. How, so how, are, how are people going to 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 um, access the virtual Shangri La? Do, do they do, will audiences need particular technologies or? They will in some if they want to. You can kind of go as deep as you like. It's kind of the same as being in the field. The more you explore, or the you know the the sort of deeper the experience you have. Right. But so you can. Um, access it on a PC. You've got to have a good graphics card, and you can access it on VR. But you can also we'll also be streaming it in lots of different ways because we, the point is that we wanted to make it as accessible as possible so that people that actually don't want to go to a festival <laughs> may still want to come because because they don't have to pitch a tent and sleep in a damp field. They can they can you know log in in lots of different ways. So we've got four different stages that will be. Um, 
streamed in various different ways on um, Twitch and Beatport and YouTube we're going to use and Facebook, just every possible way that we can um, get people in to, to experience it together, then that's what we're trying to do. One of the common themes here is, um, uh, I was going to say panic. <laughs> but maybe, maybe I'm just bringing my own, my own stuff here. Structured but, but obviously, panic. Structured panic. But, but, you know, you've all had to really pull everything together at very, very short notice. You know, it would have previously, you know, um, Neil, I'm sure it would have taken you two, two years to get the commission. So <laughs> you know, it's great. It's great to sort of see all these things happening so quickly. I'm wondering what, um, just, you know, perhaps I'll start with you, Lynn. Um, just your thoughts on, do you think that the, um, the speed that we, with which you've had to bring things together um, and the fact that you're working with in a virtual uh, environment rather than a real environment, I mean, what's that meant for you creatively, do you think? Do you think it's, as it, I mean, has the, has the panic paid off in terms of, you know, the things that you've been able to experiment with? Because I think it's really interesting to hear the, this idea. I mean, Neil referenced it as well, which is um, that you've iterated because you're able to, you know, you're able to interact with your audiences. So I'm, I'm interested in what that's doing to you for you creatively. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think there's never been a time like now where you have the permission. You have the permission to test, to be creative, to fail, to try again. You know, I think that window is only valid for a little bit longer. I think people will be forgiving for a short time to come. Um, but I kind of found that, you know, we kind of said to the guys, like, let's try stuff. Let's, you know, I know a question's coming in about pre-recording versus live. And actually, when we did our first festival, we ran everything pre-recorded purely because we we had like a conveyor belt of content and it was quality content that we wanted to still look really professional and we wanted to obviously have the lower thirds and you've got all the kind of tech around it. So for us, um, from that point of view, um, the first event, you know, was very content driven, but the creativity came in how we promoted it and how we, we, we kind of spun it around in terms of, of what we were doing in the market. So what we kind of learned from that is we then started to, you know, ch change things and do do more things that are live. So we've got the Can Do Festival coming up um, in Monday for for two weeks. So with, with that, we were now testing different models. We're, we're being, you know, a lot more engaging in different levels because we've had time to do it. But, you know, I think if you, if you look at even, you know, we're talking in, in a kind of B2B world, but even B2C, I mean, there's so much opportunity to be creative, whether it be through voice, whether it be through the internet of things, whether it be, you know, giving people that in-home experience where they can touch and they can feel and almost smell what's going on. And I think it's just from, from a, I think the creators would be so excited about this, but, you know, I think the thing we have to remember is some of this stuff's not new. So we kind of treat it as though this is a new thing. So we just didn't do it the way we're doing it now, but but the ideas are not particularly new. So, you know, one example might be, I don't know if you're familiar with the campaign, The Twelfth Man, which was, it basically was announced in 2013 and it was where in Tunisia, because of all the unrest, they banned all of the fans from the stadiums. And basically, I think it was Geometry that came up with this, particular piece of work where they use mobile apps for the fans to interact so their voice could be heard in the stadium so the players were playing the football game they were tapping their mobile completely out of angst and excitement and every time they'd done that it came out of all these speakers the, the cheering of the fans and so, so you know that was done like you, you know that's many many years ago that the, a lot of these innovative things have been done so you know, I think for some people, it's not about reinventing the wheel. The, the ideas are there, but obviously, I know a lot of agencies will want award-winning ideas. You know, I'm in the business of knowing that. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, so, so to answer your point, you know, I, I think yes, it's, it's just given us almost carte blanche, and, and I think it's allowed the teams to be a lot more creative than maybe they ordinarily would, because you're in a safe environment to an extent, because you can test and you can fail, and people are not going to crucify you for that. Um, and also you're consuming, people are consuming content and engagement in very different ways. So it's about being respectful to their environments as well. So, you know, you might have these high tech ideas, but but that's not conducive if someone doesn't have a yeah. particular set of software or so yeah. So, I mean, I've really embraced the opportunity as, as has the team and I, I can see it through the market. We, we do the experiential awards and I, I already know of some campaigns that are going to be entered into that because there's some real clever thinking. What about you, Neil, from your perspective? Um, do you, you know, I'm very interested in points you're making about having to, you, you know, uh, you're, you 
ended up in the end producing an interactive show. <laughs> I mean, will right. that have will that have um, an implication? Do you think for your future work? Is this something you know? Are you beginning to think about how this might change? Uh, the way you work or actually are you really looking forward to trying to go back to normal no i don't want to go back because i think that there's <laughs> i've learned something really important along the way really about um what the proposition basically is to the audience um and i think that it's really different now and uh, coming back to what lynn was just saying there i think the i, I guess i think you're probably right lynn in the sense that sort of technical standards will reassert themselves and i sort of in a way i'm slightly I'm not looking forward to that point. I remember uh, just with, we were just about to go into the, the very first show in the sort of week one. So that was sort of maybe we were two weeks into lockdown. And I was, um, we were, we, the, we also had the idea we wanted to hear not just obviously from members of the public, but also advice and encouragement and inspiration from other artists besides Grayson. So I remember talk, I was talking to the, um, uh, the portrait artist Chantal Joffe. And we were like, ha, 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 could barely use an iPhone, you know, like me, very sort of technophobic person. And I said, well, who's in your house with you? And she said, well, I've, my teenage daughter, Esme. And I was like, well, can she make a film about you? Um, <laughs> we obviously can't go to you and blah, blah, blah. And, you can't. and so I was sort of, remember sort of basically explaining down the phone to this 15-year-old daughter of this leading artist how to make a film, what's a cutaway, how you do this. You know, make sure you take lots of close-ups and then you go to the bit and basic and did it brilliantly. And actually, I remember thinking when it came in, that's better than if I'd sent a really good director <laughs> to make a film back on your job. Because actually it's intimate. It's it's what it's like to be in a room when she's painting a painting, because you're in the room with her and you're her daughter, and you're getting she's getting a bit annoyed with you, and you're not, you know. And actually, I suddenly thought, that's a better film for all its technical limitations than if we'd sent a really good director to spend an afternoon with Chantal Joffe making a film about her. Uh, so I remember thinking right from then, there's something about immediacy and the point of it and directness and what the truth of the thing is that um, I don't, I think we need to hold on to actually. And then the other thing I suppose I think uh, won't change is the idea, I don't know, I certainly don't want it to change, is this idea that um, it's about getting people, it's about involving people in what they're doing, in, in enriching the lives they actually have, in making the inclusivity of the proposition genuine, not just something we talk about, about diverse audiences and yada yada, but actually, how, you know, what are people doing with their time that we would bring them to this, that they want to do that thing with their time? because it's something valuable to them, genuinely good for their mental health, good for their well-being, good for all the other things. So there's a sort of, there's a sort of um, truth, I think, come out of what people are doing in lockdown. Uh, that means people are looking for um, enriching their own experience, using their own time in a more productive, stimulating, satisfying way. And I think those are things that everyone in the arts needs to hold on to because that's the core of it. Right at the core of it is can we involve people in enriching their lives and stimulating their outlook and broadening the range of things they might do with their time. That's really interesting. Kay, you are in the position really where you're just about to, <laughs> you haven't got any feedback yet from, from in terms of your <laughs> no. and so on. So, so hopefully you're getting lots of ideas from uh, from uh, uh, from our friends here, from your other contributors, but I'm just I'm just thinking um, what you, one of the things that you said that struck a chord with me was that you're not going to make any money out of it, um, <laughs> and 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 I think that's a very valid point, isn't it? In terms of uh, what you know, uh, we, a there's so much content available. How do you make your so compelling? And b what's your what's your business model going to be um underneath this in the in the in the long term so i'm just interested in in the thoughts that you've been having about about that and whether or not um you're throwing caution to the wind and you're just thinking well this is a this is a one off or whether or not you can actually see that there could be a business model and underneath this i suppose particularly given that what you're doing is um you know you it's it's slightly different in that people would normally go to your event 
principally to be there that's the whole point you know the whole point yeah. is to immerse themselves in that experience um and we, yes we've all got pissed on zoom but it's not quite the same is it really <laughs> so, <laughs> no. just i mean just your thoughts in terms of the the is there any have you done any thinking around uh what your what you know how you might commercialize this in the long run or are we just is this going to be your your, I don't know, your eulogy to, to lockdown? <laughs> well, yeah, we haven't really got that far. I mean, we know that there's massive potential in this. And the way that, the thing that I'm finding really fascinating is how I'm working, talking to our, our regular kind of visual artists, the people that we've engaged with in the past, that we'll, we'll make a sculpture and then we're, we're working at how to build it in, in the virtual world. So everybody's thinking about their work in a different way and that's really exciting. Um, I mean, we definitely could, monetize it we could charge a, a, a entrance fee but we're doing this to make money for really good causes so for bit the big issue in amnesty because we feel like you know we've got the time we've got the energy just about and um and you know in order to really really make something amazing we had to engage lots of really big artists who are all giving their time to this for the cause um we'd never be able to afford it otherwise um not with the sort of names that we have and not with the amount of work that we're doing, but I don't know. I feel like it's it's got a lot of potential. We'll just have to see what happens. But really it's, yeah, like everyone has been talking about the community is the most important thing. Um, when, you, when you're so used to, you know, dancing in front of a big bass speaker and watching a piece of live theater and I don't know, just the smells and everything that you get from being and having a, a large shared experience at a festival. Um, we're not going to be able to have so how, how do we make it meaningful and give people that are sort of I guess a an experience that we really want them to have um so you know I'm hoping we can we can get that right just by the work that we we're going to be showing the art the pieces of art that we're going to be you know putting over the, the virtual walls of the venues that we're building um and the messaging behind that that's kind of the key it's kind of key to everything that we do but particularly in this world, because, you know, these VR worlds, they can feel quite strange. I haven't really had that much experience of them before, but, um, you know, they're never usually designed in this way. And, there's, and, there's, and definitely with the live element, having a, having a DJ there that you can see, obviously the people that are attending will appear as an avatar of their making. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's just, just thinking about that and how we can, you know, things that we can maybe get people to do at home that they can sort of, so they can engage in it further. So they, they can interact with it. A lot of this is we're having to pre-record because of the sort of way the system works and because it's a proof of concept, we're just trying it out. But if we could be interactive at the same time and that, I think that is the future for it. And that's what I'm really excited about. Do you think people might be, I don't know, perhaps braver in their experiences? Um, because they're, yeah. sort of, uh, they're alone and, and they're with people, but also alone as well. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? You know, how we might, I don't know what that, what that means for, for a sort of, uh, I don't know, a live experience It'd be quite interesting. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, you can transcend any, anything through an, an avatar. You can create it how you want. You can customise it yourself. Um, you know, and, pe and people that maybe are limited physically can, can walk anywhere. They can jump and bounce and teleport around the space um yeah I, th I think people i hope i hope people will really really kind of explore it in a deep way people can mm. communicate if you're inside it um inside the vr version then you, you can talk to people you can meet people you can explore the, all of the hidden little things that we've put inside it and go in, in you know into rabbit holes and end up in other places so th that's that's a kind of exciting Mm -hmm. part of it that if we had you know if we actually can develop this and, and put time into it and some money behind it then then you know and, and then still involve all those creative brains um who knows what's going to be possible really but yeah just inclusivity that's the thing it's just getting um people there that that would never be able to go normally in yeah. the real world so um we've, we've we've got to wrap up in a minute but before we do just very very quickly i suppose just um I don't know, based on your experiences, you know, your top tip, <laughs> sorry, I know that's a bit cliche, isn't it, top tip? But anyway, um, Lynn, in terms of your, you know, you're thinking to the, to the audience, you know, what's, your, what's, your, what's your one learning that you'd like to, to yeah. share with everybody? 
I do have more than one, but uh, I will, I'll tell you what they are um, very brief, in brief. Um, I think the first rule of thumb is don't procrastinate because everybody's working very fast. And if you, if you stop, then your competitors are going to eat your lunch. Um, I think the other thing is being about being respectful to people. So don't just try and emulate a live experience because it's not, it's different. It's very different. And you have to think of people in their own environments and how they'll engage in that content and really just sort of make it feel. Because I mean, let's, if, Face-to-face -face isn't going away, it's, it's tampered just now, but it will come back. Even David Grohl put out a comment about, you know, we will be back to singing arm in arm from the, you know, belly and from our lungs um, because we're, we're human beings. So I think it's really important to think about environments, but I think it'll be dovetailed with live. I think when the physical and virtual worlds come together, it'll be exciting and 5G is going to allow us and enable us to do really, really cool things that maybe we're not doing quite yet. And I think the other thing would be about test and learn. So, you know right now you're kind of doing your best you're hustling you're you know but we don't always know what people want because they've well, never been in this situation before so you know I, I think a lot of what we're doing at the moment touchwood we've had a lot of success across the board here hopefully for yourself as well yeah. um but you know I, I think we have to test and learn get feedback and then just try again and just don't, just just embrace the opportunity so that was a kind of all roundy sort of my tip into one if you like but thank yeah, you go for thank it you. Neil, have you got anything additional to yeah, add? Just to add to that, that um, it's not either or. It's not. Um, it's as well as you know things that people do in the real world. All these new things that people are exploring their ways of creativity and stuff at home is as well as. So the number of people who've said to me, "I picked up a paintbrush for the first time." I'm not. You know, my art teacher told me I was rubbish, but for the first time, I you decided to buy some clay and whatever. Those people are more likely to go to a real exhibition in the real world or go and visit there than they were before. It's as well as, so it's a, it's a sort of, that, that I think is the first, first thing to think about it. And the second thing is, I think that what I've learned is the, the authenticity of the proposition that it is participatory. You do want people to join in. You don't mind if the whole thing falls apart or their, their sound is a bit dodgy or whatever it is, whatever the problem, it's a, People will go with you if they think you really want them to go with you, rather than we're we're sort of mocking something up, but actually we've already decided what it's going to be like and there's no possibility of it going wrong. Blah, blah, blah. We're, that's, I think, embracing the um, slightly sort of chaotic possibility it might collapse at any moment just as this soon fall by. <laughs> that spirit, people like that. People are responding positively to that. People are enjoying that. People want to join in, and but it's just that the, you you have to want them to. It has to be honest. It has to come from a place that we actually do want this to be a participatory experience, even though it's in a virtual way. Not we're pretending that it's a real experience or pretending we want you to join in, but we don't really want you to. <laughs> that I think is the big lesson for me. That's lovely. Well, I think yeah. that's a great that's a great place to end on. So, and I'm just going to sum up by saying I think what you've all been saying really is embrace the jeopardy yeah <laughs> um, so embrace or in uh, or in uh, common parlance as it's now called lean in so we're all <laughs> going to lean into the jeopardy um, so thank you ever so much it's been a you've been a fabulous fabulous panel thank you so much for for spending some time with us today i'm i'm handing back to janet hopefully hopefully the technology is going to work there she is lovely so thank you very much to you're welcome to thank Lynn, you Ted, and, Neil. and i'm going to i don't know if you can hear the audience so i'm going to give you a clap here we go thank you <laughs> I really enjoyed the session. thank you very much janet over to you thank you so much caroline lynn neil and faye what a fascinating discussion seems like there's a whole lot to learn from going from live to virtual muddling through but you reframe everything, you rethink everything. It's challenging, it's stressful, but it can still be meaningful. No, even more meaningful. Ultimately, it's really successful if it's inclusive and intimate, genuine and authentic. It's a different audience proposition, a shared experience, more accessible with more participation. It's chaotic, but then people are forgiving. So much of what you have said in this session resonates with me, and I've been chuckling as I've been listening to you. Um, as Createch, we signed up 10 weeks ago to join forces with COGX for a live festival. We almost pulled out. Two of our partner sponsors did, 
but four hung in and so did we. I can't admit it's not been without its difficulties, but people have been more collaborative, more forgiving and actually more fulfilled. We've overcome hurdles and challenges. It's been a fantastic creative experiment. Good luck. Good luck to the festival. Good luck to Shangri-La. Let's see what comes out of that. And let's keep working at both and live and virtual. Thanks for a fantastic session, a really exciting day. And now we're closing on the Createx stage, but we're back tomorrow at 10 a.m. And we may not be going to Shangri-La, but we are going to China. So we start the day at 10 with an inspiring session with TikTok, the platform that's become part of the global popular culture through COVID. And then we hear sessions pre-recorded, admittedly, but from China, talking about how behavior has changed in China and compare that with what's been going on over here. And we also have a session pre-recorded from Shanghai. So look forward tomorrow to going more international on our stage and uh, good night for now. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.